Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on functional analysis. In this video, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to see why the complex plane is a complete metric space. Okay, so before we do that, uh, we're going to need to develop a little bit of theory about the um, about the metric space on the complex plane. So remember, the complex plane is uh, a set, which is the complex numbers. So here we have the complex numbers, and then we put a metric on it, uh, and the metric that we define is the distance between two complex numbers, let's call them uh, Z and W, is defined to be the complex modulus function of Z minus W. So basically what you do is if this is the complex plane here, you have your two complex numbers, let's say this is Z and this is W. And basically what you do is you take Z minus W, uh, which is uh, if we... Uh, denoted by a vector, it's the complex, that complex number there, because uh, you have the complex number z, which is this vector here, if you like, and uh, you have the uh, complex number negative w, which is this vector going this way. So basically, when you add those two together, you get this one overall. So we could translate this to the origin, this little vector, and have it somewhere like that. So that is the complex number z minus w over here, basically. Okay, and then what you do is you take the modulus of that, which tells you uh, intuitively what it tells you is the uh, the normal uh, notion of length of that vector. I, if I get a ruler, which I happen to have over here, if I can get it, here we are, and I take the length of that uh, then uh, with a ruler, then the complex modulus function is basically going to ascribe you that sort of value. Okay, so basically what it does is it tells you the intuitive length between Z and the point Z and the point W in the complex plane. Okay, uh, right, so if we have uh, some convergent sequence of complex numbers, so let's say uh, we have a sequence X which is equal to uh, the term X1, X2, X3, X4, etc. And you go on. And these are all complex numbers. So here is the complex plane. Here is x1. Here is x2, etc. And you go on and on and on. And it converges. Let's say this sequence converges to some limit over here, L. Okay? Uh, right. So what does that mean uh, in terms of our metric, basically? So we've got this complex plane which has this metric on it. So let's just recant what the meaning of this sequence converging on a limit L means in this uh, metric space. So it means that whatever epsilon you give me, so for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a big N which is an element of the natural numbers such that if a little n is greater than or equal to big N, it implies that x little n is an element of the open ball around the point L of radius epsilon. So basically, if I draw, let me get a different color pen, if I draw uh, an epsilon ball, or uh, often in complex analysis these are referred to as epsilon disks, or an open disk of radius epsilon. So if I draw this open disk, which, which is an open ball in the complex plane, uh, so this is the open ball around the point oh sorry, around the point L of radius epsilon, then basically uh, this definition tells me that whatever radius you make this open disk, so pick whichever epsilon you like that is greater than zero here, and I will be able to find you some point which we could call uh, x big N, which is a term of this sequence, so let's put x big N here, uh, a term of this sequence basically that... Um, if you get to that term of the sequence, or any term beyond there, so that term and any term beyond it is going to be within this open disk, basically. So I can find whatever radius you give me for this open disk, I can find you a point in this sequence, a term in this sequence, for which, and for all terms after it, they are within this open disk, basically. That's the definition of convergence. So another way of writing that is that... Um, x little n minus l, so the modulus of x little n minus l, which is the distance of the point x little n from l, is going to be less than epsilon. But uh, we can split this sequence, we can rewrite this sequence basically, because this is a sequence of complex numbers. So we can write every complex number as uh, a sum basically, a sum of its real and imaginary parts. So basically I want you to split this sequence, I want you to split each component into its real and imaginary parts. We have AI, uh, sorry, A1 rather, plus IB1, then we have A2 plus I. B2, 
we have a3 plus i b3. So all I'm doing is saying, okay, these are complex numbers, which means that they have a real and imaginary part, potentially. I mean, of course, the imaginary part could be zero, so it could be a real number, but uh, they are complex numbers, and in full generality, they will have a real and an imaginary part. Now what I'm saying is write all of these out. So for each term, you have some real part, so a i, uh, and then you have some imaginary part, the b i bit. Okay. In fact, I should probably say B N and A N rather than A I, because I would be confusing because I is what we use to denote the um, imaginary constant here. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, basically, what I can say is that some any term x n is equal to A N plus I B N. Right. So I could split this sequence into two things basically. All these terms, these ANs and BNs, by the way, are real numbers. So they are but all real numbers. And basically, what my claim is, I claim that uh, if I take that, firstly, that if I take the sequence which we might call A, which is the sequence of real parts of these complex numbers. So if I get rid of the imaginary part and just look at the real parts. A4. I claim that that is a convergent sequence and that it converges to the real part of whatever this limit L up I here is. So basically, uh, the limit L, so this point here, this L, it can be split into some uh, real parts, so let's say L1 plus uh, I L2. So a real and imaginary part. So it's a complex number two, so we can split it up to a re into a real part and an imaginary part. So my claim is that this sequence of real numbers here, which are the real components of this sequence of complex numbers, is going to converge to L1, so the real part of uh, this limit L. Also, I claim that this sequence B, which is the sequence of imaginary parts, B1, B2, B3, B4, etc., is going to converge to the imaginary part of the limit L, so it's going to converge to L2. Okay, uh, so basically what I'm saying is that if we have this sequence, this sequence of complex numbers, we can split it into two sequences, a sequence of the real parts and a sequence of the imaginary parts, and basically if we want to know what this uh, sequence converges on in the complex plane, we can just take the limit of this sequence of real numbers, which we know how to do, and uh, get uh, the um, what, get the uh, real part of the limit, and then take the sequence of the imaginary parts and get the imaginary part of the limit, then just add those together and we get the overall limit. Okay, so in the next video we will then uh, prove this result.